Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode in the series of things you may have missed in Cyberpunk. Some of you may be familiar with my Witcher videos of a similar nature, but I've also decided to start covering Cyberpunk. So today we are going over 10 details you may have missed in the Corpo Life Path. And when I say Corpo Life Path, I'm referring to the intro section of the game, from the start up until the point where you get together with Jackie. Before we begin though, let me warn you that this video will contain some minor spoilers about Cyberpunk and potentially major ones about the Corpo origin. Also, if you'd like to see the following episodes or check my Witcher series of details, have a look at the playlists down in the description. Except for the two of us in Siri. Geralt has slept with every woman on this ship. Alright, that's enough lollygagging, let's get started. Number 1. Well, that's actually several details you may have missed in the data provided by your Kiroshi implants. There is a constant stream of information cycling at the top of your interface, which actually updates as you progress through the life path. Initially, when you're feeling anxious before the meeting with your boss, it tells you that your heart rate is elevated, your cortisol levels are high, you haven't been eating enough, your calories are low, all basically indicating that you've been under a lot of stress. Then, when you meet with Jenkins, your implants show some more information about him. For example, his first name is Arthur, he is 43 years old, he has no kids, likes to drink bourbon and dislikes sports. Then, after the whole European Council incident, it shows you updates on how many people were killed and wounded, the perceived likelihood of Arasaka's involvement in it, and even projects how stock prices will change based on what's just happened and gives you trading suggestions. And speaking of stock prices, I believe that's exactly what's constantly being shown to the bottom right. And finally, in the end of the life path, where you get busted by these guys, you see updates about how you are losing everything, essentially. Your money, your accounts, your access, and finally, it all shuts down. V! V! Alright, that's all for number one, moving on to number two. I did mention Jenkins and his preferences, so I suppose the second detail will be about the fact that he dies. I'm not sure if we ever find out how and when it happens, could be at the same time or around the time where you get kicked out of Arasaka, but nevertheless, his name is found in Night City's graveyard later on. And speaking of dying people in the corporal life path, at detail you may have missed number three, we have Abernathy. You know, the woman who was antagonizing Jenkins and likely caused his death? Well, she dies too, apparently by killing herself, but I think it's likely the doing of someone above her. Lover. Lover's husband. Everything. That is actually a fairly rare piece of information that we can uncover during the Arasaka ending once again as a corporal player, and it is assuming that we choose not to smash this guy's head. Jesus Christ! In fact, in my Cyberpunk review, if you've seen that, I complained about these exclusive body, tech and so on dialogue options and the fact that they are often less interesting than the regular alternatives. And this one here is a perfect example. I'm from IOC, Abernathy's initiated Protocol 4 procedures. Need to make sure every facility in Night City is secure. Abernathy? The woman who committed suicide two days ago. What? Stay where you are. Oh, couldn't be worse. Back up will get here in seconds. Fuck! Fucking hell! Fine work, chauffeur. Piss off! Let's move on to number four. So, in the game, there is a two-part video series about the backstory of Saburo Arasaka. The second part is found during the heist with Jackie, but the first is exclusive to the Corpo life path. Generally, these videos tell the story of Saburo from his birth, through his military career, and eventually into becoming the Corpo legend that he is. However, the ending of part one, the one in the Corpo elevator, sounded surprisingly suspicious to me. It tells how he was an excellent pilot, 
But one day he went out on a routine mission and his plane got damaged, which led to him being badly injured. But in 1942, during a routine mission, his plane was severely damaged. Yet, overcoming both grievous injury and a malfunctioning aircraft, Saburo managed to return to base. Join us after the break to hear what happened next. Now, when I heard that, my immediate thought was that they were hiding something. Or at least not sharing the full story. You know, the way they just say how it was a routine mission and the plane got damaged. Anyway, so all of that plays in the elevator, right? But here's the thing. As soon as you exit, right in front of you, there's a group of corpo people discussing how to cover up the deaths of three of their colleagues and present them to the media as an accident during a routine system maintenance. Once everyone else is safe, we'll issue a statement to the media. Saying what? A tragic accident during routine security system maintenance would be my bet. Meanwhile, these people were actually killed by Militech, you know, another mega corporation. However, their deaths were to be covered up under the same guise as Saburu's incident. You know, the whole routine excuse? During a routine mission, his plane was severely damaged. So yeah, this one is a bit of a conspiracy theory on my part. Perhaps those of you who are familiar with Mike Pondsmith's lore will enlighten me on the matter. Right, time for number five. This is probably something everyone knows about, but given that I've made a million Witcher videos, I cannot not include the magazine with Siri on it. By the way, that spectacle with the coin, what was that? Emperor's got lots. It's a retro gaming magazine you find in the drawer next to your desk, with The Witcher 3 being game of the month. We can see CDPR's logo below Siri and a piece of text that says achievement facts or development facts or Gwent facts, I, I don't know for certain. I suppose it's a happy coincidence that my main character in Cyberpunk is a corpo because that appears to be the one life path who is canonically a Witcher fan. No, it's always been about you, only you. It sure seemed like it was about the coin in there. Siri, I... If it wasn't, you shouldn't have accepted it. Okay, time for number six, which is right above number five, not just in numerical terms, but also literally. You might accuse me that this is not truly a detail, but more of a mistake, but it's something that confused me real hard, so I want to talk about it. Okay, so you have your second monitor to the right with a bunch of news, a chart of the stock market, and a calendar with today's weather forecast. The first thing I noticed was the date. Monday, the 6th of December 2077. And don't rush to write comments yet, just bear with me. So that's what I thought. And then I saw down below a chart of the stock market from June 29th until August 30th, the same year. So apparently the corpo is interested in prices from a few months ago. All right. Then I thought to myself, let's fast forward the real world calendar to see if December the 6th, 2077 really is a Monday. And what do you know? It is a Monday, or I guess it will be a Monday. So I thought that's super cool. But then it hit me. A bunch of things happen after the Life Path intro, and then another six months go by before the Sandra Dorset mission. So if it was December back then, then the whole game takes place in the middle of 2078, right? So it can't be true. And then I realized it's the USA. They do it the other way, you know, month, date, year. So this has got to be the 12th of June 2077, right? Now, if you fast forward the real world calendar to that date, it's not a Monday. But on the other hand, the weather forecast seems more plausible. You know, for a cloudy summer day, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 28 degrees Celsius, seems natural. So it has to be the 12th of June 2077. But then I don't know about the data below, maybe Arasaka is predicting stock prices of the future. However, it hit me again. If it's the middle of the year now, then another half a year goes by before you even get started with the prologue. Um, and that basically means that the game starts in the beginning of 2078 once again. And so, long story short, everything written on this screen is nonsense, right? It's, it's not the 12th of June or the 6th of December, or anywhere in between the 29th of June and the 30th of August 2077. It's all wrong. 
It has to be earlier than that. And thankfully, there is a small clue which seems plausible. Not on this screen, though. It's actually a little earlier. You can find the shard before the elevator with the top five employers of Night City. And in there, when listing the benefits of Militech, they make it sound like Christmas is not too far from the time this was written. And what do you know? That's exactly the case. See, during the heist, later on, you can see Saburu's diary, which sadly is usually bugged, but if you manage to read it, the last entry is on the 121st day of year 2077, which, as it turns out, is the beginning of May. By the way, I like how he casually writes about leveling Night City to the ground. But anyway, enough complaining about this, let's move on to number 7. Actually, now that I mentioned the top 5 employers shard, let's talk about that some more, because you do learn a few curious things about the big corporations which operate in Night City. More specifically, about their work ethics, if such practices can be called ethical at all. For example, the fact that Arasaka, as the number one best employer, offers a surprisingly short 20-year loyalty obligation. Which, I assume, means that you can't quit unless you get fired for 20 years? Meanwhile, Kang Tao, a Chinese megacorporation, requires a 50-year loyalty pledge. No wonder they're at number 4. Also, it claims that Arasaka outfits its employees with top-of-the-line cybernetics. And this is indeed reflected in gameplay, because as we mentioned, the Corpo V is using Kiroshi Optics. Another curious thing about Night Corp at number 5 is that they have recently reduced their mandatory work hours down to only 80 per week, which apparently is great for the family-oriented people. So yeah, it's no wonder that employees have high cortisol levels. Okay, finally moving on, there is another small detail here, and another conspiracy theory actually, which is not mine. I've heard it a few times, and I believe it's wrong, and I'll tell you why. So, when you get into the AV, which takes you to Liz's bar, you can optionally ask for an update on Night City's districts. If you do so, you learn about the increased police activity in Haywood, and how even Maxtac is probably involved, as well as the blackouts in Santa Domingo. Increased NCPD presence and activity has been reported in Haywood. No official statement has been forthcoming. Intercepted radio communications suggest Maxtac has been sent to the area. A widespread power failure has been reported in Santo Domingo. Now, curiously, these are the exact same events you hear about when you launch the game. Yesterday's body count lottery rounded out to a solid and sturdy 30. 10 out of Haywood. Thanks to unabated gang wars. One officer down, so I guess you're all screwed. Cause the NCPD will not let that go. Got another blackout in Santo Domingo. Netrunners are at it again, poking holes in the power grid. However, I've had a few people message me about a theory that apparently hints at the fact that the Corpo intro and the Street Kid intro take place at the same time, and that the police activity they're talking about in Haywood is the ending of the Street Kid life path where you get busted trying to steal the car. Now, it is true that the events in the Street Kid intro take place in Haywood. Increased NCPD presence and activity has been reported in Haywood. But I think that's where the similarities end. The two police cars which arrive at the crime scene are hardly anything newsworthy, and they're definitely not Maxtac. Now, with that said, there may be more evidence to support this theory, so I don't want to write it off, but I think this here is not it. Alright, at number 9, we've got this guy. Initially, you see him walking away from a conversation over to this table, and then, after you've spoken with Jenkins, the people he was talking to come over to join him again. Now, he is actually the same person who gets roasted by Saburo Arasaka during the Corpo ending. Or rather, the Arasaka ending. Ah, magic trick! Magic. 
Sadly, he doesn't seem to recognize you. Um, I suppose you might say that you are much too insignificant for him to notice, but still, it would have been nice, you know, to have some dialogue with him here and then have him recall that during the ending, but still. And finally, at number 10, I've got another small detail slash missed opportunity at the very end of the life path. You know how you're talking to Jackie in the bar? This is one of the scenes where I really liked the first-person perspective. It has a kind of personal aspect with you and Jackie. It has a sense of depth with, you know, the rest of the bar and when Jackie talks to the waitress. Now, what do you say we look her up and talk life? And then when these guys suddenly entered the frame, I got a little startled and I really liked it. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, here's the thing. Despite the fact that you are constantly being forced to face Jackie, if you keep looking to the side, you can actually see these guys slowly entering the club. They even stop someone to talk to at the entrance, and then they proceed to approach your table. I like the fact that they animated all of this and made it more believable, but I think it would have been nice if you could react somehow in case you notice them. Perhaps you can have a unique dialogue option appearing if you look in their direction as they're entering. Or perhaps have them react somehow if they notice that you're watching them. It would have been nice, but still I appreciate the fact that they were properly animated as part of the scene and they didn't just spawn out of thin air. Oh, and here's another curious thing I caught while re-watching this last part. Have a look at this guy. See how he separates from the rest and never approaches you? This is actually Frank. You know that friendly guy from earlier? I didn't know you were in Night City. How have you been? Ah, uh, you know how it is. A week ago I was still in Cape Town. Did he lead them to you? Was he forced to do it and perhaps he feels bad about facing you? Who knows? And um, yeah, I think with that, we're done. Tell me what you thought of everything I talked about. Was there anything you didn't know or anything that you thought I should have included? Cyberpunk is a fairly detailed game, so there will be a lot to talk about in these videos, but um, it is a bit of a letdown in other aspects. And if you want to know more, you can check my review. But back to this video, if you enjoyed it, feel free to give it a like and perhaps to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet done so. My voice sounds a little better. In most videos, I am a little sick now, so probably not a very good first impression for the first episode of this series, but uh, bear with me. Alright, thank you very much for watching, special thanks to my YouTube members and supporters, and until the next video, stay tuned and be good. <laughs>